Don't do it backwards like a dog trainer. Check out the layered stress model. Hi, this is Rich with Off Grid Dogs, Tampa, Florida. And I'm crazy about you because you love your dog. So if you hire a dog trainer, um, they're usually going to start right off with either communication, figuring probably correctly that uh, the pet owner is not communicating well with the dog and there lies the problem. So um, they're gonna start right off with uh, you know, teaching the dog uh, how to communicate and uh, you know obedience training. And then the, the other thing, even worse, they might start right off with the actual behavior problem. You know, if you hired the dog trainer because uh, the dog uh, gets fired up when he sees a strange dog walk by, uh, he might start right off with, uh, you know, counter conditioning or something. So um, that's, uh, in my judgment, very backwards. So let's be smarter than dog trainers and do this correctly. And that is, why don't we find out what's causing the problem and take care of that. And uh, that's where uh, I like to bring up uh, something called the layered stress model. So my whole theory of dog training has always been, um, you know, if the dog is, if his needs are being met, he's not going to have, uh, very likely to have behavior problems. And I see everywhere I look, uh, dog owners that do not meet their dog's needs, do not even come close. And in fact, they don't even realize what their dog's needs are. So how can they meet them? So I made a video about that called, uh, what are your dog's needs? Uh, which I highly uh, recommend. Most dog owners need to see that video. But um, I've been using this idea for a long time. And a good example is the dog I have currently um, to uh, try to avoid behavior problems from ever beginning. So I don't have to deal with them. And it's worked very well for me. Um, the um, the layered stress model I discovered about a year ago, um, I, I heard from it uh, from a trainer named J. Jack and another trainer named uh, Chad Mackin. Um, I'm not sure if they invented it. I don't think so. I think they got it from somebody else, but it sort of uh, made it easy to explain the theory that I've been using for years. Um, so basically, um, the idea being that, you know, if you're, if you're going around all day long, every day, really stressed out, it's got, not going to take very much to trigger you and cause a, a blow up or a behavior problem. Uh, a good example uh, I'll steal from Jay is that uh, if your wife comes home from work and you've been cooking a meatloaf uh, for her, um, when you guys go to eat the meatloaf and she cuts into the meatloaf and it's slightly undercooked, if she screams and throws the meatloaf across the room, um, you're probably not going to ask her, you know, or you probably are going to ask her, uh, what's the matter, honey? <laughs> You're not going to assume that it's the meatloaf. So, because that's not a, you know, obviously a normal reaction to undercooked meatloaf. So you're going to assume correctly, probably, that she had a very bad day for some reason. So, you know, what happened at work? Did somebody die? Did you get fired? Um, why don't we do that with dogs, you know? It doesn't seem, we would always do that with a human, but we don't do it with dogs. So, um, you know, nobody's ever going to go to a human and say, uh, okay, I'm going to counter condition you to undercook meatloaf. Here, look at this undercooked meatloaf and I'm going to give you bowls of ice cream to make you feel better about it. Um, no one's going to say, oh, we need to desensitize you to undercooked meatloaf. We're going to start showing you meatloaf that's only slightly undercooked and then a little bit more undercooked and then very undercooked and gradually just no we're going to find out you know what's really going on what's what's the matter honey why'd you throw the meatloaf across the room <laughs> so um this is a, a a thing we need to do with dogs so the layered stress model basically 
Um, let me show you a picture of it. Picture this volcano is when the dog will explode and let's use a hundred point scale. Um, so the, the, the base of the foundation is health. Then next comes um, you know, living biologically correctly. And then number three would be um, clarity. Number four would be the leash. And then the trigger is what causes the explosion is number five. So basically, that's just to give you a mental picture. Um, if 100 points is required for someone to blow their stack, let's say your dog, um, if you're going around all the time really stressed out and you're at, say, 95 uh, on the stress scale, then it doesn't take very much to get you to 100. So if seeing a strange dog walk by on the leash is worth 10 points, so it's not super stressful, but it's, it's 10 points of stress. If you're already at 95, then that's all it's going to take. You're going to be over 100. You're going to blow your stack and freak out and ruin the walk. And nobody's going to want to walk you because you freak out like that every time you see a dog or a person or whatever the trigger is. So um, why not find out why that dog is going around at a 95 all the time and help the dog not be so stressed out? So the foundation, of course, the, the first thing to look at is health. So whenever I take on a client, I'm going to ask questions, find out, you know, make sure the dog is likely to be healthy because, um, you know, if he's got a health problem then you need to know that and that could be the issue. So most of our dogs in America are not healthy. Um, most people feed their dogs kibble, which is the worst thing you could put into, into a dog's body. Um, there's lots of other options. Do your own research. You don't have to feed a dog dog food or kibble. Um, you can find something healthier uh, without going to too extreme or too much expense or too much trouble. Um, it's getting easier all the time as more and more people become aware of this and more companies um, are putting out products that are better. But uh, yeah, if, if a dog's eating kibble all the time, that's all he eats, then he's probably pretty sick. Um, and when you're sick all the time and you don't feel good, you don't uh, behave uh, as well. Um, another thing we do is we neuter all these dogs, you know. Once again, bad, bad choice. Um, do your own research, but, and I've done videos on this in more detail, but, um, you know, it's going to cause all sorts of issues and, um, you know, you need your endocrine system intact, but um, um, thyroid is a big one, um, which will cause bad behavior, just a lot of other things. So if your dog's not feeling well, you know, you might have um, something that's uh, physically obvious if you were aware of it. Most people, you know, they don't, uh, uh, they're not real uh, careful about checking their dog out all the time. In my family, my wife is in, ch in charge of that. She brushes our dog every day. She's aware of every square inch of his body. You know, if there's a pimple that wasn't there the day before, she's aware of it. So, you know, give your dog a rub down or a massage and, uh, you know, he'll let you know if something's hurting. But, um, so, you know, get enough exercise, getting a healthier diet. Um, let's stop neutering our dogs. Let's Let's do the real research on that and the real science and find out all the bad health issues it causes down the road. Um, and, and zero benefits, I might add. You know, they, they lie to you. They tell you about all these benefits of neutering and spaying. Um, so get the dog healthy. That's going to lower his stress that he carries around with him every day. Um, if you feel good, you're not as stressed out. Lifestyle, number two, um, is your dog living in a biologically appropriate lifestyle? 
Not many dogs are that I see, unfortunately. Um, one of the first things that I would do when getting a dog is plan for that appropriate lifestyle. For example, um, I'm a lab guy. I've mostly had labs, except for one Siberian Husky. So when my wife decided we were getting a Great Pyrenees, I was like, uh-oh, you know, not much experience with livestock guardian dogs. So I did some research and I, once I did some research, then I really said, uh-oh, this is gonna be different. How am I gonna get this dog? Because I don't own a mountain full of sheep for him to guard, which would be his living his best life, um, being left alone on a mountaintop with the sheep with no humans around um, would be what he's supposed to be doing. So I started trying to figure out, I found out they were very independent and this can vary within the breed, but that's a good place to start is what breed are you getting? So, um, because there will be general breed characteristics. So this is a very independent breed. It's not uh, easily trained because they do their own thinking, their own decision-making. They're left alone to guard the sheep without anybody telling them what to do. Um, very primitive breed, so it's very strong in their genetics. So um, we came up with three things that have worked very well. We've, we've had this great Pyrenees now for almost seven years, and uh, we've never had any zero behavior issues the whole time. And um, I think a big part of it is that we gave him a few outlets for his um, lifestyle. So first thing I thought of was, was how, how's he gonna make his, do his own decision making? So once I got him, um, and I'll say I, I'll say we, because I give my wife a lot of credit. Um, doing well on walking and, and you know, uh, decent obedience, you know, for a great purities. Um, I started letting him make all the decisions on the walk, or at least as much as I could. You know, I, I wouldn't let him decide to run out in front of a car, but other than that, which way he wants to go, um, if he wants to stop and sniff, this is the opposite of what most dog trainers will tell you. But, um, I already know that he's he can heal when I want him to heal or if I need him to heal. And I know he'll come back to me if I call him back to me. So I put him on a flexi leash where he's got 25 feet in every direction or 50 feet diameter of freedom. And I let him zoom around and sniff and decide, well, dad, I want to go this way because I smell something interesting over there. Okay, go ahead, cross the street. He'll, he'll ask me politely. He'll sit down and let me know. I'd like to go over that way if it's okay. Sure, go ahead. So he gets to make decisions. So instead of a, an hour walk where he's prisoner next to me and can't do anything, and, he, and I'm making all the decisions, he's getting to use his brain and decide, no, nope, today we're gonna go that way. No, nope, today we're gonna go this way. May not sound like much, but it's probably pretty important to him. Um, another thing we did, um, once we realized what he was like, and you know, you have to pay attention to your dog and really f figure out what your dog's like, because not every Great Pyrenees or every German Shepherd is the same. Um, but we realized this dog just loves to just sit and survey the neighborhood or whatever. You know, obviously he'd probably rather be surveying the mountaintop with the sheep, but it's the next best thing, it's what he's got. We live in the suburbs. <laughs> I don't recommend that for a Great Pyrenees unless you know what you're doing. So, um, so yeah, he loves to be outside like all Great Pyrenees pretty much. My wife likes to be outside. She sits out with him on the patio. He doesn't sit on the patio with her. He likes to sit way out, maybe 50 feet away where he can watch 360 degrees, the whole neighborhood, you know, so he's back, he's away from the house a little bit so he can see all the way around in every direction. And he's in heaven. He just loves to guard and, and to watch. And, you know, he'll give a couple of barks if something weird's going on, uh, as they're supposed to do. But uh, because he's not all stressed out, he doesn't bark hysterically or nonstop. He just does his job 
couple of barks. We acknowledge that we saw the threat and he's good. Um, and then the, the third little thing that I can think of right off the bat that we do, again, he's a livestock guardian dog. Uh, he's, his job is to bark away a threat. So when there's a knock at the door, you know, and it's usually the Amazon man, um, we'll give the guy, we have a, a screen front porch that he'll drop the package off in. Once he's gone and we hear the screen door shut, he's leaving the package. I'll open the front door, you know, and, and Taboo, my great Pyrenees, he's already barked a couple of times at this point to let us know, hey, somebody's at the front door. And let him bark at the guy's butt as the guy's walking away to his truck. And he'll bark a few times and, and he'll get the satisfaction of seeing the threat leave. So, and we'll praise him and, he, and he'll feel great because he did his job. We had a threat at the front door in his mind. He chased it away with barking and he saw the guy leave and go away. Boy, he is satisfied. He is ha a happy dog. He did his job and it worked. So these are little things that we do. But that's to make up for the fact that we don't have a mountain with a flock of sheep for him to guard where he can stay out there you know, all night garden sheep. So, so just to give you an idea of, of, you have to be creative, you have to figure out what is your dog like, you know. If you have a Labrador Retriever, he probably likes retrieving, you know. You're gonna play a game of fetch with him, but you have to find that out for sure because not every Labrador is the same. Um, so give him that appropriate exercise, mental stimulation, the lifestyle that the dog needs, his stress is going to come way down. Um, just those two things, health and lifestyle, could solve a lot of your behavior problems if you hit those two. Okay, number three is a big one, clarity. Everybody needs clarity in their life to be able to be confident and to relax and not be stressed out. So, um, most dog owners don't have good communication with their dog. So that's one reason, that's one of the first things dog trainers work on. Um, but teaching, you know, you, you know, when you see the dog owner going, sit, 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 and the dog's ignoring them, you know, they don't have communication. Um, structure can create clarity. So over and above obedience training, just how you live with your dog, your dog knowing that he's allowed in these rooms, he's not allowed in that room. Um, what he's supposed to do in, in certain situations. One of the biggest problems people have with this is consistency. You know, a lot of my customers that are hiring a dog trainer to help them with their behavior problems, they, they're not consistent. So how could the dog have clarity? So it's okay to do, to jump on people when he's a cute puppy, but now he's gotten big and it hurts and it's not okay. Or, you know, counter surfing is cute when I don't have anything important up there, but uh, now I've got this fabulous meal I'm preparing and you just knocked it onto the floor. So you've got to be consistent, learn how to communicate with your dog, give him some structure. And this will vary also from dog to dog. Um, a super confident dog doesn't need as much clarity. Most dogs are not super confident. So help your dog out, give him clarity so he can run. I, I heard uh, one of these trainers that were explaining this uh, at a seminar, he, uh, he made it, the comparison of like, if your wife was going to a party and you said, honey, we're going to a party Thursday night. First thing she's wanted, gonna wanna know is what kind of a party? What are we supposed to wear? Do we need to bring anything? She wants clarity so she can relax and be confident going to the party. If you're like, well, I don't know. We're just gonna go. <laughs> we may be dressed all wrong or we may not be bringing the right thing with us. She's not gonna be too happy because, you know, unless she, she's super confident, she's gonna want more clarity than that. So the fourth thing, uh, the fourth layer level of the layered stress model is the leash. Most people fail big time on this. 
with their dog. Um, you have to understand you're asking a lot of your dog to walk on a leash. And it's almost impossible if you don't put the work in to help them out with that because it's so unnatural for a dog. Um, and people don't get it. They think, oh, why, why don't, why didn't the dog like this? We're, I'm taking him outside. Doesn't he like to go outside with me and walk and, and, and sniff? And sniff? So um, they don't understand why it's so difficult for their dog to walk on a leash. A dog walks five miles an hour. We walk two miles an hour. Um, our social bubble, if you're walking with a friend of yours and you guys are talking as you're walking or hiking or whatever, you're probably no more than three or four feet apart. If, he, if your friend is 25 feet away, you probably don't even try to talk to him. Um, dogs social bubble is like, uh, probably at least a hundred yards. They'll, they'll run off 50 yards away, a hundred yards away. And then they might look back to see where you are before they even are worried about it. So you're asking them to condense that in onto a three foot, four foot leash and walk two miles an hour when they they walk five miles an hour. Um, it's just not something that they do very easily. So you need to help the dog out, uh, teach the dog how to walk on a leash. Um, when he's when he's good on the leash and you and you are absolutely confident that you know he's, you've got his obedience training down and he'll heal and he'll come back to you and all that. Um, I highly recommend the flexi lead or whatever you call that thing, flexi leash. Um, a lot of dog trainers make fun of it, but uh, it's good enough for uh, world champion Ivan Balabanov. He sings the praise of them and I adore them because I'm old and I can't run with my dog, but I can, when he stops to sniff, I can walk 25 feet ahead of him and when he goes to market, I just take off as fast as I can walk. That way he can jog or even run for 50 feet plus all the extra I give him. It probably ends up being almost 100 feet if I walk real fast. By the time he passes me and goes 25 feet past me, he got to run for 100 feet. And, um, you know, that's you know, a little bit of extra freedom for the dog. But um, the key is when you're asking them to walk right next to you and not sniff everything, and that's a very difficult thing to ask of a dog. So um, learn how to do that properly so the dog's not pulling on the leash and you're hating the walk and you're not walking the dog and you're in conflict. This is all gonna add more stress. So if you're not good at walking your dog and your dog is not good at walking with you, of course you're gonna have problems when he sees a trigger, whether it be a garbage truck or a strange person or a strange dog. Um, it's like anything else. If you practice it, you'll both get better at it and you'll start to enjoy it when you get good at it. It becomes very enjoyable, but it reduces the stress. So the good news is, if you take care of these first four layers of the layered stress model, the health, the lifestyle, the clarity, and the leash, when you get to the trigger, guess what? It's not gonna matter because it's still gonna be worth 10 points or whatever, you know, that garbage truck or that strange dog or whatever triggers your dog. But if your dog is no longer at 95 when he sees the trigger, if your dog is chilling at a 35, and then at 10 points for the trigger, oh, he's only up to 45. Well, he's cool. He, he doesn't blow a stack till he gets to 100. So, and you've so improved your dog's life, uh, quality of life, um, you know, you're, you're just gonna enjoy your dog so much more. You're also gonna create a bond and a relationship. Um, 
So if you do need to work on a trigger, you're going to have that bond going for you. You're going to have that much more leverage, that much more trust and respect. This can be a whole lot easier to deal with those triggers if you have to counter condition a little bit or something. But um, to me, dog training and dealing with those triggers is the least important. You know, that's the only reason you even have to do that is because you didn't do the important stuff. Do the important stuff and everything else pretty much takes care of itself and it gets, everything is a whole lot easier and you're gonna enjoy your dog a whole lot more. Your dog's gonna enjoy life.